Hey, Wonder Hussy here. Deep in the coastal redwood forest of Northern California at my mom's house. Now my mom, okay, you know how I travel around with my one sister and she's really private, doesn't want to be on camera. And then, well, last week I was hiking with my other sister who's even more private and doesn't want to be on camera. Well, my mom is also very private and she definitely doesn't want to be on camera and she doesn't even really want me to show her house and it's a crying shame because well where she lives is absolutely amazing she did give me permission to shoot a video on her property so that's actually where i am right now and i'll give you a quick peek but shh, don't tell anyone okay that right there is my mom's cabin as you can see it's really cozy and she's got an amazing garden and a really cool purple gate that she painted but we're gonna go down here. This little staircase that goes down through this amazing redwood forest, by the way. I mean, look at these trees. Woo wee. But we're gonna go down these stairs to her guest cabin. That's right. She has a little guest cabin on her property that, well, she was renting out uh, for a while but her last tenant moved out and she decided to just leave it open for a while um, because one of my sisters might move in for a bit she's between residences and actually my sister that i travel around with she actually lived here for an entire year one time okay let me show you guys this cabin is so cute so you can see it's like a little two-story kind of like a studio affair with its own little patio surrounded by redwood trees it's got like a little like a little sitting area down there. But we're gonna go inside here. <laughs> Again, my mom likes to paint colorful doors. Who doesn't? We're gonna go hang out inside the cabin because it's hot out there today and it's much cooler in here. Even in these redwoods, it gets hot, but it stays surprisingly cool inside this cabin. So <laughs> why am I down here in this cabin? Well, I just wanted to show you guys how cool it is, first of all. You know what I mean? It feels like I'm in one of those videos where I'm exploring a, a volunteer cabin in the desert. But you can see it's really cute, kind of like, well, one room with a loft up there with a bedroom in it. But it's got a wood burning, real cozy wood burning fireplace. Nice little table with, again, amazing view of the forest. And then obviously a full kitchen with all the modern amenities and a full bathroom with one of them cool old claw-footed bathtubs. And then upstairs is the bedroom or loft, I guess, sleeping loft. And there's nothing up here right now because like I said, she's between tenants, but that also has an amazing view of the forest and a closet and a little desk area. Really a cute place to live. Now, like I said, my sister that used to travel around with me, she actually lived up here for an entire year once. Um, I think I've mentioned before in my videos that she once had a corporate job made really good money, but just got tired of it and decided to quit and go be a vagabond hippie. And I think she stayed here for a year while she was trying to figure out what she wanted to do. And she said it was nice, but whew, it gets cold in the winter up here. Even though we're in California, these coastal redwoods are no joke. They're, if you've ever been in a coastal redwood forest, there's like fog and mist for days. And it, oh my gosh, it's bone chillingly cold in here. My sister would have to get up every morning, get out of her warm, cozy bed, come downstairs, like stoke the fire, get the house warm. She had to keep her coconut oil. She used coconut oil for moisturizing. Well, she had to keep it like... I think she had to keep it on the stove at all times just to keep it from freezing. Oh, it gets cold here in the winter, but it sure is nice here in the summer. Why did I come down here to this cabin? Well, I guess I just wanted a little bit of privacy so I could shoot this video. See, I've been up here at my mom's house for a week now, and the other day I was looking through some old family photo albums, you know, old pictures of me, and it occurred to me that some of you might be curious about my background. I mean, I know in some of my videos I've mentioned stuff like well, that I grew up in California and now I live in Vegas and I worked as a nude model. But I figure some of you might be curious why a nice girl like me would move to Vegas in the first place, how a nice girl like me would end up working as a nude model, and thirdly, how it is that I started a YouTube channel. So I thought this might be the perfect time to sit down and tell you my life story. So I'm gonna sit down here at this little table and have myself a cocktail 
This is my favorite cocktail. It's called a Negroni and it's equal parts sweet vermouth, gin, and Campari. And well, it tastes like ass, but it really packs a punch and I have acquired a taste for them. So if you wanna make yourself a cocktail, go ahead and pause the video and then come back and join me. Cheers. Okay, let's get to it. I guess you could say certain aspects of my personality were sort of predestined from the very beginning <laughs> since I was born in the San Francisco Bay Area to two idealistic young hippie parents at a hospital named after John Muir. And I was delivered by a doctor named Dr. Chronic. That certainly explains at least part of it. When I was really little, uh, we lived in different places around Northern California, but then when I was about four, my dad had, well, sort of a meltdown and randomly enlisted in the army and ended up getting shipped over to Heidelberg, Germany. So my parents basically ended up splitting up as soon as we moved over there. But I guess my mom was kind of like me and wanted an adventure. So she decided to stay in Germany with me and my little sister and she got a job as a secretary on the army base and we ended up staying over there for eight years. Now, at first, my mom thought it would be a good idea to enroll my sister in me. Remember, my sister's only 18 months younger than me, so we're pretty close in age. I think I was about five and my sister was around three when this happened. Well, my mom thought it would be a good idea to enroll us at a German kindergarten because when you're that little, you can learn a foreign language really fast. <laughs> we didn't speak any German, but sure enough, gosh, especially my little sister, we're fluent in German and probably about two weeks. But after kindergarten, we went to school on the army base with all the other American kids. We didn't live on base though, because my parents were divorced. I guess my mom didn't qualify for base housing. So we lived in a German neighborhood and just took a bus to school. But I think it informed my development and it gave me a sort of outsider mentality. I mean, I was a literal outsider. I had to take a special bus to school and go through a guard gate just to see my friends. And well, yeah, it gave me this kind of outsider mentality that I think persists to this day. I guess I've never really felt like I fit in. <laughs> I mean, even when we moved back to California when I was about 12, you know, my clothes were different. My hair was kind of funky from living in a foreign country. And at that age, remember I was 12, all you want to do is fit in. So I used to stress out about it quite a bit until in high school, I got beat up by a couple of mean girls. And at that point I decided it would just be easier to remove myself from the entire equation and let my freak flag fly, which I've pretty much been doing ever since. I was one of those kids in high school who dressed really funky. Like I had, uh, I would dye my hair all these different colors and I carried a copper tea kettle as a handbag, okay? I was actually voted most unforgettable by my senior class. <laughs> but I actually friggin' hated high school and college wasn't much better. Well, I never really knew what I wanted to be when I grew up, but I ended up going to college because well, I was smart and that, I guess that was kind of what was expected of me, but I didn't know what I wanted to major in. And I, I, gosh, I used to stress about it a lot. And people would just say, oh, don't worry about it. Major in what you love and it'll all work out. Well, I was an artsy fartsy person. So I ended up majoring in art. And to be honest, to this day, that hasn't really done me any good. And in retrospect, I wish people would have just advised me to minor in what I loved and major in economics or pre-law or something that could actually help me out in this world. So anyway, there I was with an art degree and no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I mean, fortunately, at least I didn't have any student debt. I went to a state university and the tuition wasn't crazy expensive. So my mom was actually able to pay my entire tuition in exchange for me helping out with my younger sister and brother. I have another sister who's nine years younger and a brother who's 12 years younger. So I would go to classes at college in the morning and then I would come home in the afternoon and pick them up from school and help them with their homework and clean the house and you know do all the stuff my mom couldn't do because she was working. But eventually I graduated college and then I really had no idea what to do. I mean, remember I have an art degree and I'm living in the San Francisco Bay Area, which even then, you know, housing was expensive and 
gosh, I just, I had no idea. But I felt like I had to get a job, so <laughs> the first real job I got was at IBM. The IBM Corporation. I went to work as a secretary at IBM. And let me tell you something, it didn't take very long at all for me to realize that I did not want to spend the rest of my life working in an office. I wanted a glamorous life. I wanted adventure. And instead of moving to New York or LA, for whatever reason, <laughs> the place that seemed the most interesting to me at the time was Las Vegas. So I started formulating a getaway plan while I was still working at IBM, tucked away in this miserable basement office. I started a blog and I wrote about how I'm gonna move to Vegas and I'm gonna get a big pink car. Not a 50s, like 57 Chevy or anything like that. No, I wanted a big malaise era land yacht, like in those old mafia movies. So I actually ended up settling on a 1986 Lincoln Town Car, which you, if you've ever seen a 86 Lincoln Town Car, first of all, it's 18 and a half feet long. And it's probably about half of that wide and it handles like a friggin' waterbed. But hey, I got one and I had it painted Pepto-Bismol pink with pristine white interior and a white top. And the very next day after picking up the car, I moved to Vegas. I'm not exaggerating. The very next day, I set sail for Vegas. Now, my plan was to become a cocktail waitress at Caesar's Palace. I don't know, to me that just seemed like the ultimate and glamorous Vegas jobs. Back then, and maybe they still do, wear like this little white mini Roman toga and they walk around, cocktails, drinks. And I just thought that would be such a great job. I'd make so much money and I'd find myself some rich sugar daddy and oh, everything would just be great. But unfortunately things don't always work out as planned. Apparently I, because I didn't have any experience, they wouldn't hire me at Caesars Palace. So I had to go for plan B and I got a job as a souvenir photographer in a showroom. You know, like when you go see a show in Vegas, if you've ever been to Las Vegas, you go to a show or you go to a restaurant, this annoying chick comes around with a camera like, hey, let me get together, let me take your souvenir photo. They'll be waiting for you after the show. There's no obligation to buy, just buy them if you like. Well, believe it or not, I ended up doing that job for 12 years. I worked as a souvenir photographer in Vegas for 12 friggin' years. And it was really hard at first because well, believe it or not, I'm actually a really shy person by nature. I know it doesn't seem like I'm shy and I'm actually not shy now, but gosh, ever since I was a little kid, I was just like painfully shy, you know, excruciatingly shy. So when I moved to Vegas and I got this job as a photographer where I had to walk into a room full of strangers every night with a stick of camera in their face and then try to sell them this ridiculously overpriced photo, man, that was really tough. So I'm not gonna lie, I actually had to have a drink every night before work for, gosh, probably the first few years that I did that job. <laughs> every night before I drove to work in my big pink Lincoln, I would have not anything hardcore, it was like Malibu and pineapple or something fruity and light, but you know, just enough to make me not nervous to go approach a room full of strangers. And after a few years, I realized, oh gosh, I don't even need a buzz anymore. I could do this. And I feel like I actually did genuinely change my nature. I feel like I am, truly at heart, no longer shy, which I, I'm i still kind of on the fence. I wasn't sure was it's actually possible to change an innate quality like that. Like, I feel like I was very introverted and now I'm extroverted. And I know, well, I know alcohol does a lot of really bad things to a lot of people, but for me, it really helped me. So cheers and thank you. Anyway, like I said, I had the job for 12 years, even though I really grew to friggin' hate it. I mean, I'm not a salesperson by nature, um, but I ended up being one of the better performing salespeople in that company, even though I'm not a hard seller, I'm not pushy. It was always like, you know, hey, buy it if you want it. If you don't, that's okay. Um, I guess, I don't know, my personality or whatever carried me through and I, I, I made pretty good money. I always made a, at least 150 bucks a night and back then and still today, I think that's plenty to live on in Vegas. Vegas is pretty affordable economy. Um, and I only worked from like, you know, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. or something. So what, four hours a night, it was very easy to just keep going in and doing it. 
but I was wasting my days. I had the whole day free. I didn't have to go into work until 6 p.m. I mean, you can only sleep until two in the afternoon so often before you get bored. So <laughs> this is why I wish I would have started a YouTube channel way before I did. Because, well, I started going on Craigslist and taking all these random gigs to make some extra money and, well, fill the hours before I had to go to work as a photographer. So, man, I did some gigs, man. I worked as a cigarette girl, you know, walking around the casino. Cigarettes, cigars. I worked as a Hooters girl. I mean, I only went in and applied for it to see if they would hire me, despite the fact that well, I really don't have any Hooters. <laughs> and then once they hired me, I only kept the job long enough to take pictures in the uniform and quit in like a week. And then I also worked as like a mascot at conventions and like a test dummy for doctors that were learning how to use ultrasound devices. And then I handed out samples at Walmart. I mean, you name it, I pretty much did it. But I never really did any modeling gigs because I felt like well, I'm 5'3", I'm too short, and moreover, I'm built like a penguin. I have a long torso and short legs, so I'm not even built like a model. And I'm flat chested, so I don't know. My impression of what a model was really didn't fit how I looked. But, you know, I was working at trade shows as a mascot, and I saw these other girls that were working as booth models. And, well, it made me realize that there's actually a lot of different types of models. I mean, yes, there's a model, like a supermodel, like a runway model who is tall and thin and, you know, makes tens of thousands of dollars a day. But there's also a ton of women who work as, well, it's called promotional modeling, where you're just working like trade shows and events and, you know, those girls who come into the bar in like Jägermeister outfits and hand out free Jägermeister swag. Well, I did a ton of those kinds of gigs. I never worked for Jägermeister, but I did gigs for like Jim Beam and Budweiser and Miller Lite and American Honey and a bunch of different brands. <laughs> now, around that time, I was also in a relationship with this guy who was pretty straight. It's a long story and it probably deserves its whole separate own video, but I don't know, for a couple of years, I was really into like going to the golf course and going to the country club. And I mean, gosh, I don't know. I guess I must've really been in love with this guy. In fact, we even bought a house together. And well, when we bought the house, he made me put all my kooky stuff, you know, like my mannequin and my costumes and my, even my maps, you know, the maps that I keep on my wall, that was all kooky. And I had to keep it all in this one room in the basement. So when we finally did end up breaking up, I had this sort of like rebirth and sort of like this epiphany, like now I can finally be the bohemian that I truly am. Now I can let my freak flag fly. Well, at this point I had already started modeling for photographers, but just like, you know, uh, glamour shots, cute fashion type stuff. I would never pose nude, but you know, here I am having this, you know, <laughs> bohemian epiphany. It's like, well, if I'm so open-minded and if I'm such a free spirit, why won't I pose nude? I mean, I had no moral opposition to nudity and it's not like I was, you know, planning on running for public office or getting some kind of square job. So what difference did it make? And so the first nude photo shoot I did wasn't even for money. It was just to prove a point to myself that I really was open-minded. But after doing that first nude photo shoot, I realized, hmm, I could charge money for this. And I could make more doing this than I could working as a friggin' convention mascot or medical test dummy. Because even though there's a ton of models in Vegas, there's really not that many models that are willing to pose nude and don't have any tattoos or fake boobs. And those were two big selling points for me, even though, like I said earlier, I'm short, I'm built like a penguin and I'm flat chested. Hey, I have natural boobs and no tattoos. And moreover, I was willing to go out into the desert because a lot of photographers want to shoot, you know, these beautiful desert landscape nudes. And well, a lot of models understandably are, you know, either too afraid or well, frankly, too lazy to actually go out on location like that. So for a while I had like almost a monopoly on these photo shoots and I stayed really busy. I mean, I did a lot of photo shoots in hotel rooms too, but I didn't really like being inside casinos. I'd rather be, I guess even back then I was an outdoors person. I'd rather be out in the great outdoors. And my deal was for $500, I'll drive over to your hotel, 
pick you up and then take you out to three or four different desert locations and pose nude at each one and then bring you back to your hotel at the end of the day. I mean, that was like the deal of the century, but I did that for quite a few years and hey, I managed to support myself doing that full time. I mean, at first I was still working as a souvenir photographer at night and just doing modeling during the day. But once I, you know, realized I could make a lot of money doing these outdoor nude photo shoots, it seemed a lot more appealing than going into work for somebody else at night. Cause I had, well, I had really started to loathe that souvenir photography gig because it was, well, frankly, it was kind of shady. You know, you're pressuring people to buy this overpriced Chinese junk. And well, a lot of the people I worked with weren't completely ethical and I butted heads with my boss. And I guess the bottom line is I just don't like working for someone else. Even though being a freelancer is difficult because you have to be in charge of your own finances and really good at budgeting and you know, there's gonna be lean periods you have to set aside for that. I would take the freelance life a hundred times over working for someone else ever again. And I hope I never do. Freelance or death. I mean, yes, technically I know I still work for YouTube or Google and so I have to, you know, abide by their policies. And I know that I also kind of have to abide by your policies. Whatever you guys want to watch is what I have to shoot because gosh, about half my income comes from fan donations and Patreon. So, you know, it's not like I'm completely just doing whatever I want, but oh my God, I would take this lifestyle over working for the man any day. I mean, sure, there's downsides to being a freelancer. Like I said, you have to, you know, pay your own health care and manage your own retirement and finances. But gosh, I have a pretty good work ethic. I'm pretty, well, I'm pretty organized. I'm pretty anal. And well, golly, I'm a hard worker. I mean, just look at my YouTube channel. Uh, I upload new videos every Wednesday and I'm pretty sure I have never missed a Wednesday since I started the channel. And speaking of that, Gosh, I wish I would have started my YouTube channel years ago because, oh my God, I did so many interesting gigs working as a model, especially when I started working as a fetish model <laughs> that it would have made for some amazing content. But for whatever reason, for all those years, I just wrote a blog about it at wonderhussy.com. The blog is still up, you can go read it. I mean, it's pretty interesting. Unfortunately, uh, you might encounter a firewall because I used to post some NSFW photos from my different photo shoots and stuff. I mean, there's nothing pornographic on it, but you know, it does discuss some adult uh, material. And so unfortunately the blog is flagged as an adult website. And because of that, I wasn't able to monetize it using Google AdSense. But then I randomly stumbled into YouTube and that changed my life. I'll never forget it. I was on my way back from Burning Man in 2016. And for some reason I took a different route home than I normally did. I came down a different highway into Nevada and I'm, I was driving my pickup truck at the time, towing my old vintage travel trailer. And I saw these creepy old abandoned buildings off the side of the highway and like, whoo, I gotta stop and check that out. Because well, I was still working as a, as a nude model and part of my job as a nude model was always looking for interesting new places to pose for photos. You know, I would do a lot of photos in nature, like on sand dunes or on dry lake beds or in the red rocks. But a lot of photographers like shooting a nude model in a ghost town, like some crumbling old building. So I was always scouting out creepy abandoned places. And well, here I am driving over Burning Man and I see a doozy right off the highway. Well, it turned out to be an abandoned brothel called Janie's Ranch. I didn't know any of this. I just went in with my camera and I don't even remember why I decided to make a video that day instead of just taking photos and writing about it, which I would normally do. For whatever reason, I made a video exploring this abandoned brothel. And then a little bit farther down the highway, I came across an entire abandoned town with an abandoned casino. I mean, it was just unbelievable. The route I took was like the, the abandoned highway. It was awesome. So I shot a couple of videos and for whatever reason, I don't even remember why I just kind of uploaded them to, I had a YouTube channel because I have a Gmail account. Anybody who has a Google account, you automatically have a YouTube channel if you want. And so I just kind of would throw up videos every once in a while. They never really got very many views. Well, I put these two videos up and Golly, to my surprise, I got all kinds of email from people. I mean, back then, I didn't even know what urban exploration or urbex 
is a big um, genre of uh, people exploring abandoned buildings. I didn't know what any of that was. I just thought I'm some goober shooting this old, weird, creepy, abandoned... Well, I didn't even know it was a brothel at the time. But all these people emailed me going, Oh, wow, it's so interesting. You should do more Urbex videos. I'm like, er, who? What? What is this? So I had to do a little bit of research into it. And then I realized, well, actually, the big epiphany came when... I can't remember how, but I checked my AdSense balance, my Google AdSense, which is what pays you from YouTube. And I realized there was money in it that I actually earned money from posting these videos. Well, that changed everything. In fact, I remember I was here at my mom's house. It was like Thanksgiving 2016 when I uh, took out my first Google AdSense payment. And I was like, oh, I can make money doing this. Okay. And from then on, I think... I think starting about then I became pretty regular about uploading videos every week on a consistent basis because like anything, well, I have a strong work ethic and I'm determined and I'm smart. So I did my research and I read, you know, what makes for a successful YouTube channel and consistency was one thing. If you upload consistently, that's how you build a following. So gosh, every week, come hell or high water, I would upload new content on Wednesdays and well, here I am four years later and I'm still doing it. But over the last four years, I've kind of graduated beyond just shooting abandoned buildings, which is what initially I thought that's all people wanted to see. And I still do get a lot of hits on my abandoned buildings stuff, but I also branched out obviously and started doing, you know, nature stuff like Mount Whitney and the little Grand Canyon and the Grand Canyon and well, quirky, weird, off the beaten path, tourist attractions and creepy small towns in Nevada and just all kinds of stuff. I mean, there are so many interesting places all over this world. I don't think I'll ever run out of ideas for videos. Now, I have heard talk about creator burnout, which I guess happens to a lot of YouTubers. You know, you are on a, you're on a pretty strict schedule. Like you have to come up with new videos, in my case, every Wednesday. I mean, it's not like I can just skip a Wednesday and go, oh, sorry guys, I've been depressed or I was too tired to go out. Oh, I'll lose a bunch of followers. I know how fickle things are. So every Wednesday, you gotta go out and find something interesting. But you know, I guess that wears on some people after a while. But for me, I mean, I don't have like the biggest <laughs> subscriber base in the world. Like I have a million subscribers. I'm not PewDiePie or someone like that. But my subscribers, even though I don't have a lot, lot, it's quality, not quantity. They're, you guys are cool. Like I get really nice gifts from everybody and really encouraging messages. Like I don't really get a lot of hater comments. So I just want to take a minute to thank all of you for being so awesome. But I don't really feel myself experiencing burnout, mostly because I still have such enthusiasm in myself bubbling up constantly for the world. There's so much amazing stuff in the world to explore. And I haven't even hardly left the Western United States. You know, I feel like I could just make videos in the Western US for, gosh, at least a few more years. And then I can start moving east from there and then all over the world. And I'm really enjoying the process of learning how to be a, <laughs> filmmaker. <laughs> you know, I started out just goofing around with a GoPro or whatever I was using and you know, I'm still just using my cell phone, but I'm really enjoying learning like shooting techniques and editing stuff and special effects and you know, adding background music and I don't know, the, the video making aspect of it appeals to me a lot more now than it did at first. So I don't know, I like watching my videos improve too. And I still have plenty more to learn. Anyway, that's how I got to where I am now. If you were ever curious as to how I got where I am, now you know. If you don't know, now you know. And well, I guess I would say I don't have any regrets. You know, there were a few times in the past where I thought like, oh, well, maybe by posing nude, I limited certain future opportunities. But you know what? Now we have a first lady who has nude photos of herself and that's not even a big deal. So, you know, say what you will about the current administration, but I feel like that's some kind of progress. And now that I think about it, I used to think I'd never be able to run for any kind of political office because of my nude modeling background, but I guess that doesn't matter anymore. Wonder Hussy 2020. <laughs> Just kidding. I would never want to be president because I'm having way too much fun being a YouTuber. Cheers.